So next up we have Dr. James Stamp. He's going to be talking to us about planting material. And it's very nice that he um, agreed to come and speak with us today. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to learning from you. Thank you. Let's welcome James. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for inviting me here today. I feel very pri privileged to be here with such a great group of growers and uh, experts in all their fields of relating to grapevines. I'm going to talk about grapevine planting material and um, hopefully it uh, makes sense and it's interesting. The goal of quality assurance for grapevine production, it's very basic. When you order grapevine plants, you want to make sure those grapevine plants are to deliver to you that they're high quality grapevine plants, that they're delivered in the correct amount, that your order is completely full when you get those grapevine plants, and that the delivery is on time. Um, you don't want any surprises, so uh, it's very important to be in good contact with the nursery through the production of your vines, so if there are any surprises, you'll know about it in, in advance so that you can actually uh, make changes or uh, figure out alternative approaches should your order be uh, short. Uh, the vines, of course, should be virus test negative, that's a given, and the talks today we've heard are all about producing virus test negative vines, but of course they should also be of good physical condition, and the, the physical condition of the vines is directly related to the pathogen load of those vines. So if you receive a, ba a batch of vines that have bad graft unions, poor root systems, poor callousing of the rootstock disputing sites, the likelihood is that those vines will have high levels of fungal pathogens in them. So it's a, it's a good way of ensuring that you're getting pl plant material by actually looking at it and examining it before you plant it. Just a background for everybody who may not be aware of this. Um, today we're all talking about Protocol 2010 materials in California. This is a range of plant materials that have all been uh, produced through Meristem culture, as Gerhard uh, discussed in the South African situation. Um, the CDFA provides vine material production guidelines, uh, and these are um, documented under the Grapevine Nursery Certification Program. Foundation Plant Services cleans, verifies trueness to type, and establishes foundation block vi uh, vines in the foundation block, block vineyard. This vineyard now is called the Russell Ranch Vineyard, and they plant two vines per selection in that vineyard. This vineyard is uh, located between Winters and Davis in, uh, up in, up in uh, near Sacramento. Um, so these two vines, of whether, it be, whether it be Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, Cologne 47 or Sauvignon Blanco 1, these two vines in Davis are the source of all the plant materials that you receive from your nursery. So a nursery would uh, request uh, cuttings from those two vines, They'd get, those, they'd get those cuttings and they'd establish those, they'd propagate those cuttings and establish their own increase block, which is basically a mother block, but it's an increase block of foundation derived material. And they would uh, plant those, those increase block vines, rootstocks and scions. And when they were big enough, they would harvest buds and rootstock cuttings from those increase block vines to graft to produce your order. So that's the origin of all the plant materials that you get, um, generally speaking. And, if you have a choice, it's best to uh, order Protocol 2010 materials because the likelihood is they're cleaner, they have less virus, and they're also newer blocks, so they're, they're also less likely to have fungal contaminate, have heavy loads of fungal contamination. Propagation quality assurance, these are some of the essential steps. Um, nurseries should be doing this and you should do this as a concerned grower because we all know what a, what a massive investment it is to plant a vineyard and have to take it out. So you want to be involved or asking questions about all the steps of the propagation process. Um, this is what we do with my consulting business. So the first thing to do is to select a nursery that you feel comfortable with and I'll mention some, um, some pointers in a few moments. So select a nursery that you like or you feel is a good nursery, but the most important thing is increase block selection within those nurseries. You want to work with increase blocks that look healthy. And increase blocks can vary from a few rows to many acres. Um, so it's important to look at the increase blocks. 
test and tag the increased blocks in late fall. The best time to examine these vines is when the symptoms of the virus are most obvious, and this is basically late October to November, depending on the location of the, uh, the vineyard. It's important to walk both sides of the rows of the increased block. Um, it's actually quite interesting to see how vines can look differently when the sun is shining toward you or shining behind you. One nutritional, um, one, one, in one direction it may look like a nutritional problem, in the other direction it might just look like a leaf roll or red blotch. So it's very important to walk both sides of the increased blocks with your partner. Um, if the increased block doesn't, doesn't look good, walk away from it. Find another increased block. Find some other rows of contiguous vines that look healthy. And once you've found vines that look healthy, then you can test them. Uh, the virus titer is very variable, so you want to at least test two pieces of tissue per vine, given that you have a cordon vine, so you can capture the variability. And again, you want to test all of the vines that you're going to be using to produce the, uh, the, the propagation system and the grafting that you need. Um, once you've tested these increased blocks, you want to uh, keep, keep, keep sight of them. So you want to make sure that the, 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 the materials that you tested are actually harvested and go to the grafting to make sure those tags that you put on those vines are actually appearing at, how, at grafting time. And then you want to be in touch with the nursery to make sure that the, um, the callousing is successful because you can know within three or four weeks of grafting whether your order is going to be filled or not. So it's always a good idea to talk to the nursery three or four weeks after grafting or five weeks and ask them, ask them did they pot up the plants that were, that were callous and how many vines did they pot up? Um, and then look at the vines during the production cycle. So if it's a greenhouse production, if, if you're looking at green vines, you want to examine the vines in, the, in the, um, the greenhouse roughly halfway through the production cycle. It roughly takes 20 weeks to produce a green vine. So around 10 weeks, go and look at the vines to make sure they're there, make sure they look healthy. You might also see at this point in time crown gall, which would then be uh, very important to see that. Um, same with the field situation, look at the vines in the nursery row. Again, if you see uh, instances of poor take in the greenhouse or the field, you can see this very early on after grafting. You may have the opportunity to regraft if necessary and address the situation, which, is a, which will obviously impact you later on if the vines aren't there. And then ultimately, you want to be involved or at least ask questions about how they select and grade and, and test the finished product. If it's a green vine product, generally speaking, the vines will be clean because they will not have been in the external environment after doing your initial upfront testing of the increased block materials. However, if, you, if you're working with dormant bare root materials, it's a good idea to look at those bare root materials in the field in October to see if you see symptoms of disease and you can see symptoms then and also to screen them at that point for red blotch and leaf roll three to see if, if perhaps they've become contaminated in the nursery row. How to select a nursery? I think the biggest thing, apart from having um, you know, a, a good location and um, having some experience hopefully of this nursery and their increased blocks is, is communication. Like everything we do in this business, it's all about problem solving and communication. So if you have a nursery, that will not call you back in a timely fashion, you know, within 24 hours, it's difficult to actually move forward and make plans. So you need to have excellent communication and transparency. You want to have regular updates from the nursery as to the vine production status. So call them up if they don't call you up. Um, the nursery should have protocol 2010 increase blocks that are distant from commercial vineyards. Um, commercial vineyards, they could be wine, wine uh, vineyards or table grape vineyards and they're often associated with mealy bugs so it's better to work with nurseries where the increased blocks are not close to commercial productions. Um, the nursery should have an in-house virus test program, they may talk to you about this. Ask the question of how often do they test their increased blocks, what viruses do they test them for and what percentage of the increased block vines are tested. So that's very important information. You want to take a look at that before you place an order to see what the history of those increased block vines look like before you do any further work. Does the nursery have a mealy bug control and exclusion program? And do they have modern sanitary facilities? Um, factors affecting grapevine performance and longevity. As I mentioned, the physical condition of a grapevine plant is um, really, it really tells a story about the internal condition of the grapevine plant. You won't get good root systems, good graft unions, good healing of the rootstock, this pudding site if there's a high level of fungal pathogens within those vines. Given the fact that we've done the due diligence and that you've selected materials that are to graft that are virus test negative, 
The next step is to ensure that those materials look healthy in terms of uh, carbohydrate reserves and wood to pith ratio. But when it comes to examining the finished product, um, if the finished product doesn't look strong, then you want to walk away from those vines. And there's various ways of looking, looking at those vines, and I'll discuss that in a moment. But fungal pathogens, bacterial pathogens, and virus, viruses all affect the physical condition of the finished product. And so if you have a weak finished product, then of course mechanical, biotic, and viticultural practices will all impinge on that plant. So if you, if you, if you, you know, accidentally J-root the vines, or if you insufficiently irrigate them, if you have a weak vine because it has high fungal pathogen loads, the likelihood is that vine will succumb to disease uh, and to young vine decline pathogens more rapidly than a strong vine. Virus agents of greatest concern, if you, have to do, if you do nothing else in terms of planting materials in California, you should test for red blotch and grapevine leaf roll three. There are other viruses of concerns, but those are the two that you must test for. It doesn't make any sense to plant grapevine, grapevine plants in California without doing that minimal amount of testing. And those are the two viruses that are most likely to be there, and those are the two viruses that are going to have the biggest impact on your bottom line. Um, we have found pathogens in Protocol 2010 increase blocks in the last two years. We found leaf roll 3 in a repair to our increase block, and Pinot Gris virus in 1616 uh, increase block, and grapevine Pinot Gris virus and grapevine yellow speckle viroid in a Cabernet 47 increase block. Agrobacterium is widely prevalent in all, in, in all uh, increase blocks and, um, and also finished product. And also, it's likely that the, the plants you get from a, 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 a nursery program will contain fungal pathogens. Interestingly enough, um, this, ta this table of information was released from UC Davis FPS at the annual meeting in December. And at this point in time, they recognized that 21 accessions of plant materials at Foundation Plant Services, the source of all the plant materials that go to, go to the nurseries, had red blotch. Um, so it's a very sort of uh, devastating information, I think, for the industry that our basic source material, our foundation material, is contaminated with red blotch. For the, and you know, the question is, what will happen with that material? Will, will this disease spread? Um, we'll find out in, the, in this coming few months. Red blotch. Um, Mark did a very good um, uh, questionnaire about what red blotch looks like. Again, in reality, red blotch and leaf roll three, in my opinion look very very similar it's very hard to distinguish them especially when the when the when the virus and the disease has been pre has been present for a few years or um, that then they, the, the symptoms are basically indistinguishable this photograph shows a young a young infection where it does look more like red blotch um, this table here shows the data from the work we did between 2000 November 2012 when the, uh, the, the test for red blotch was first available through to the middle of 2014. Most of these are CDFA certified increase blocks and we tested this over, these over that one and a half year period and you can just see the high level of contamination of increase blocks either with red blotch or leaf roll 3 during that time period. If you look at some of these combinations such as NTAV, Cabernet 15, there were only three NTAV uh, blocks at the time and two of them had red blotch. The same with Cabernet 169, there were only three NTAV blocks at the time, two of them had red blotch. And then uh, clones such as Cabernet 7 and Sauvignon Blanc 01, it was very, very difficult to get plant material either without leaf roll 3 or with red blotch. This next photograph shows results of planting a vineyard with red blotch in Rutherford back in uh, 2012. The top row shows uh, rows of vines that were, that were virus free. And those vines were hard, the, the fruit was harvested, harvested at 28 degrees bricks. The fruit went through complete ripening, and the winery realized an FOB gross wine reven revenue of $90,000 per acre in their premium wine production program. However, the vines that were, po were positive for red blotch were harvested at 25 degrees bricks. They had impaired ripening of the seed components, and the, 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 that fruit fetched $7,500 in the bulk market. So a massive impact, um, red blotch can have a massive impact. Sampling strategies. The best way to sample for producing grapevines free of viruses to sample before you graft them. You get a much better bang for your buck. If you, uh, so like a Cabernet 7 or a Sauvignon Blanc one increased block vine could have three or 400 buds on it. So if you test one vine, you could be testing potentially three or 400 subsequent vines that are propagated from that. 
Most nurseries graft it maybe one and a half to two times overage. So if you have a, a Cabernet Sauvignon vine with 400 buds, you might be testing at the end of the day 200 finished product. Um, so it's very important to test up front if you can. And if you're going with a green vine production system, the likelihood is it will not become contaminated during the greenhouse process. Um, as I mentioned, visually evalu evaluate and test and tag every increased block vine as late as possible while the leaves are attached. And um, in terms of selection of materials, you want to collect woody materials for most of the viruses, although you can also use green materials for red blotch and fan leaf virus. And if you're working with um, a nursery where you believe they have a crown gall problem, some nurseries have more problems with the crown gall than others, you could potentially go ahead and screen your samples for crown gall, Agrobacterium vitis tumorigenic strain, before you test for viruses, which could save you a lot of money. And if you're also working, for example, with your own budwood selection, if you like that, you, you could pre-screen that for red blotch and leave for all three. And then if it tests negative, go ahead and do other tests. So again, that could be very uh, economically beneficial to you. <laughs> Sampling strategies post-grafting. If you end up buying some vines from a nursery, you've had no interaction with these, nines, with these vines beforehand. If you can look at those vines in the nursery row uh, during the fall before they get harvested, first you'll see if the vines are there. You'll see if they look healthy, you'll see if it's the right clone, right variety, and you'll see if it looks healthy in terms of development of red blotch and leaf roll symptoms in the nursery row. And you can, see, you can see symptoms in the nursery row. If you're looking at a finished product that's already been harvested, use statistically significant methods to test that finished product, again, for at least red blotch and leaf roll three. Um, an increased block can vary from a few rows to acres and acres. This is just a diagram showing that in this, in this, in this particular in increased block, there are two rows of Sauvignon Blanc and three rows of Durifo 3. Um, so potentially you might remove, the, a nursery might remove the Sauvignon Blanc 01 increased block, but leave the, leave the Durifo 3 block there. But they're right adjacent to each other, so the chances are the Durif could also be contaminated. This is a photograph of what a typical rootstock increase block looks like. It's, it's basically a mess of grapevine plants, uh, canes. The canes are all growing on the floor, they're all inter intertwined with each other. It's very difficult to get out there and test them, so we always test the, the rootstock increase blocks when the leaves have fallen. And this is an example of a, a defoliated increase block. You can see some tags on, some yellow tags there on the vines. These vines uh, are, are being tested um, and getting ready for um, harvest. This is a photograph showing you an increase block of a sign increase block. This is really the ideal time to test a sign increase block. The leaves are just about to fall off. This is a red variety. You can see some red leafing on the left-hand side of the screen. Those are mecha that's mechanical damage. But you can see it's a beautiful looking vineyard. And if you walk down that vineyard with your, with your colleague and tag both, tag, tag, look for, look for uh, sick vines. Avoid the block if there are sick vines, but tag all the vines for testing. We, we uh, tag the end of the row, and then we put tags on usable cuttings, so we can see those tags coming through when the cuttings are harvested and when they get grafted. So we know that those materials are test, have been tested. And here is an example of going through and testing a incre uh, sign increase block after we've already visually evaluated when the leaves have fallen. In terms of red blotch um, detection, we've talked about um, but the, what the symptoms of white varieties look like. It's very, very difficult to determine if white varieties have red blotch. This is a Chardonnay 4 increase block on, uh, at the beginning of November. It looks perfectly healthy. A month later, the two dark green vines down the row were red blotch contaminated. So we see, I see an increased block with Chardonnay that the leaves, uh, contaminated, vi contaminated vines tend to hold their leaves longer than non-contaminated vines. And in this case, the leaves uh, sort of turned green bronzy. With red varieties, I see, uh, from my experience, I see the development of leaf roll 3 symptoms in advance of red blotch symptoms. So this is a Cabernet 412 block, an entire block that looked very healthy at the end of September. Uh, however, in the beginning of November, it looked terrible it, and it, would, it was contaminated with red blotch. So if we'd looked at this increased block in late October, September, October, we wouldn't have seen this. So again, everything's about timing and looking at the vines at the right time. Fungal and bacterial pathogens are still of great concern, and that's what really, really got me involved in this business nearly 20 years ago, the concern for a young vine decline. So the pathogens associated with young vine decline are Phaeomoniella, Phaeoacrimonium, and Solidocarpon. These are opportunistic pathogens. 
they're pretty much in every most of the nursery stock you buy today, whether it's from you know whether it's from any nursery, uh, it's probably going to have some level of fungal pathogens. That's again why examining of the physical condition is so important because basically, the, if you test them, it's probably going to have the pathogen. But if it's strong, if it's a strong plant with good graft union, good root systems, you know it must have a low load. Otherwise, it wouldn't be so strong. Pathogens prevent propagation wound healing in nursery stock. So st standard propagation methods mean that most, most new vines are contaminated with opportunistic fungal pathogens. Opportunistic means that if the vine is stressed, they will uh, make the plant sick. So again, if the vine is strong, it's less likely the vine will be sick. These pathogens affect the graft union and propagation wound healing and root development and can, and can cause the development of lesions at the graft union and rootstock base. Not only are the vines stronger if they have lower pathogen load, uh, vines that are contaminated with the disease show internal symptoms that are very um, characteristic. So on the left is a very healthy looking rootstock shaft. This is a one year old dormant rootstock uh, rooting. If you, you should cut your vines in half, obviously you can't plant them, that's the good news. Um, that's a joke. Okay. Uh, so you, you should cut at least some vines in half to see what they look like. They should look like the image on the left. If they look like the image on the right, halfway between the base of the vine and the top of the vine, you should reject vines that look like that. That, that, that discoloration, that gumming and those exudates are a result of the vine trying to cut off the movement of the, 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 of the, um, the pathogen through the rest of the plant, causing the typical symptoms of young vine decline. How to identify low pathogen, low healthy vines? The percent take in the field or in the greenhouse is indicative of the general health status of the lot, so if there are very few vines there, then probably the vines that remain aren't very good. Um, careful external, external and internal examination is essential. And dormant vines, dormant bare root vines should withstand moderate flexing. So if you take a dormant vine product and you bend it a couple of ways, if it breaks, again, you can't plant it, but it will tell you if there's something wrong with that vine. So here's an example of a vine that was bent. It didn't have a great root system to begin with, but you can see this uh, halfway along there, you can see the crack in, this, in, this, in the trunk at the top part. And so I scraped off the bark after I cracked it so you could see how much of that vine was not there. It did have an inferior root system. So again, it's very important to select dormant product with complete root systems because that, that where you know there will not be a rootstock shaft there, a, a rootstock sh shaft lesion there. Um, product, green versus dormant, um, growers like different types of products, but the big advantage of green vines is they haven't been grown outside in the environment, which is, uh, which is quite important considering the spread of red blotch and leaf roll three. If you're taking vines off the shelf, spec vines, you should test for red blotch and leaf roll three, and you should evaluate the condition of the vines for fungal and pathogen load through the examinations I described. Last couple of slides here. Um, I think sometimes we forget how important grapevine plants are to all of us. Um, we ask a lot from, from them. Um, this, this data I have here is from Napa, so I it doesn't really apply to Lodi, or maybe I, I apologize for that. But I, I talked with one of, my, one of my friends and he said that um, he calculated that uh, the, the, the net per vine fruit value from a 20 year old Cabernet, Napa Cabernet Sauvignon vine at $10.56 uh, £10 per vine was 572 vines. So one vine gave him $572 uh, worth of fruit. The wine from that vine equated to $3,233 worth of wine from one vine over a 20 year period in Napa. So it's, it's a huge amount of investment and it's a really valuable product. So going forward to me, it seems that we need to be having a discussion about how we not only get rid of viruses and keep viruses out of the vineyard, but how, we, how do we provide, pr produce grapevine plants that are resistant to viruses. And with the advent of gene editing technology, as CRISPR, I'm sure you've heard about it, we do now have tools that will allow us to genetically modify grapevine plants so that we leave no trace of any foreign genes in those grapevine plants. And so my, my interest is to see that, and I talked with Erin about this the other day, is that, you know, 10 years from now, are we still going to be here worrying about how to plant grapevine plants, or are we going to do something that's going to allow us to have grapevine plants that are resistant to leaf roll and red blotch, so we can actually avoid some of this discussion? So I think what we need to do is to engage consumers in a conversation about genetically improved vines, what are the pros and the cons, and how it could be advantageous to the industry in general. And just the final slide, um, you know, what do you want to spend $3.50 on, a Starbucks or a, or a vine? 
a big difference in terms of what you get from it. So my, my, my sort of point is that grapevine plants are undervalued. They're very, very important to the whole industry. But, you know, people don't like to pay more than 350 for a grapevine plant, but it's, it's basically the basis of everything we do, and it's very, very, very important. I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging Stephanie's awesome organizational events today, and thank you for inviting me. It's really a real privilege to be here with you today. And I thank my staff. I also want to thank the nurseries that work with us, and thank you for your, your transparency, nurseries, and our clients too. And thank you very much. My favorite thing today as a new grower and new PCA, learning management, best management practices, and also keeping, when you have a young beater, keeping it clean and really getting after it, and learning also insecticides and rotations to really get after it. I think those are the biggest takeaways for me.